Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Sunbury Motors, North 4th Street in Sunbury, and Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. Sports talk where your voice counts. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motor Studio, here's Steve Jones. Good afternoon, everybody. It is the Steve Jones Show on Hump Day. Macatrello here with you. Steve will soon be there from the Sunbury Motors studio. Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. And online at sunburymotors.com. Ford, Kia, Hyundai, lots of pre-owned inventory. A great service department. They'll help you with those state inspections or if you need to get a big replacement for your car your current car that is or if it's just a simple oil change they'll get you covered there at the service department and a terrific sales staff that's all not there just to complete the sale but to make sure that you get the best car for your buck and that's best for your family that's why they're the home of the repeat customer and that's why we love our friends at sunbury motors fourth street in sunbury sunbury motors kia routes 11 and 15 in hummel's wharf and online at sunburymotors.com. We're recapping what was another remarkable run for Penn State wrestling and getting yet another national championship. The radio man himself, Jeff Byers, will join us today to recap everything and what was another remarkable run for Penn State. I think for me, I'm not really a big wrestler. I've covered wrestling, but it's it's not my it's not my niche. But I can definitely appreciate what what Penn State has done. And it seems like they had a little bit more of some challenges and some adversity to overcome this year than recently in some of their other runs. So it was another just a terrific run for Penn State. So we'll recap with Jeff Byers today uh, about another national championship for the Nittany Lions wrestling program. And tomorrow, looks like we'll have Tom McCarthy back on with us, of course, the TV voice of the Phillies on NBC Sports Philly. Of course, he's doing March Madness on CBS and Westwood One. So we will hear from him tomorrow. Looking forward to having Tom McCarthy back with us tomorrow. Now, the NFL again. This this offseason is definitely, without a doubt, the wildest offseason I've ever seen with the NFL. I mean, we're all these different trades and what exactly is being given up for them and all of these different almost super teams at at, at this point now. I mean, and it's all in the AFC. The AFC is going to be insane to watch this year. Now, this latest trade, I kind of really don't understand it on both sides here from a football standpoint. You look at look at the Chiefs. I'm not one to question our, our boy Brett Veach from Mount Carmel, but Tyreek Hill was still a good part of that offense. Now, I know you got a lot of pieces left over. I know he was at the end of his deal, so clearly the Chiefs didn't want to pay him a big contract because, of course, they have Patrick Mahomes' $450 million deal. I don't know where that goes in terms of salary cap and uh, salary cap hits and how that works in the future for the Chiefs, but you're still talking about a guy that was – really pretty important to their success on the offense and especially with all the moves that have been made in the division literally everybody in the division has made supposed upgrades or looks like will be upgrades especially when I look at the Chargers and what they've done especially defensively I think they're the biggest threat to the Chiefs right now the Broncos and Raiders I don't think so 
the Broncos are going to be interesting to figure out because if they can stay healthy offensively, they had a half-decent defense last year. What can Russell Wilson do? I think he's on the tail end of his career. I don't think it was just what the situation was in Seattle. I think it has to do with him a little bit too. But still, you have to throw that out there as a as maybe things turn around in Denver. And with, that, with the Vegas Raiders, it just seems like we expect them to take that next step every year, but they really don't. And I don't know if the Adams trade really does that. And there's other holes that they have to fill. And I just don't I don't know about Derek Carr as a Super Bowl contending quarterback. He's a good quarterback, but I don't know about a Super Bowl contender type quarterback. But still, I think if you if you're the Chiefs, I think you just find a way to give it one more year with with Hill. But you can't help but they get what they got back. I mean, it, it's clearly an offer that they couldn't refuse either. Five draft picks. 2022 first round pick, 29th overall this year. Second round pick this year, which is number 50 overall. Fourth round pick and fourth and sixth round picks in 2023, according to Adam Schefter. But for Miami, though, <laughs> I'll tell you what. Stephen Ross is an absolute fraud. And we knew that before. I'm not breaking new, any news here. But considering all of the headlines around him possibly with, with the way things ended with Brian Flores and the whole tanking allegations. This is him clearly trying to trying to cover cover for himself and so he can simply say, "No, I'm trying to win. Here, look, I made I made this big splash trade. I'm now making Tyreek Hill the highest paid receiver in the league. They gave him the Dolphins in addition to the trade give him a 4-year, 120 million dollar deal. So now we can easily make that argument. But guess what? You have 5,000 other holes to fill, including a quarterback. And you missed out on Deshaun Watson already. So what do you, What else do you have to build besides him? And not only that, too, you give up all that draft capital on top of it all. You have nothing else to build except maybe some more money. I know the Dolphins had the highest amount of cap space going into this offseason. But when you're in a situation where the Dolphins are in, you got to build through the draft as well, and you have lost all that. So I that's why I don't get it from the Dolphins' side of things. I can somewhat understand it from the Chiefs' side of things, though. Again, I I think you know Tyree Kill was is worth keeping. But th- this this thing for the Dolphins. <laughs> All it does is it gives you, it puts you in the spotlight for a couple of days. That's it. It'll give it'll give you something to account for on that offense, but that's it. This Dolphins team has a load of other issues, and they don't scare me one bit. Now, apparently the Jets were involved in the talks, too. It was between the Jets and the Dolphins. Had he gone to the Jets, then that might be something interesting because, of course, and it would make more sense, too, because you have the Jets are clearly oh, trying to build around Zach Wilson. The, yeah, the Eagles have missed out on another one. I, I'm yeah. okay. I'm okay with the Eagles not being involved. To me, if I'm giving up five draft picks, it better be for a quarterback. I'm not giving up five picks for a receiver. I don't care how good you are. I, I just said before. Oh. I think the Dolphins and Stephen and Stephen Ross is an absolute fraud for making this trade. <laughs> he is. As I just said, considering all the allegations he's had about tanking. He can just easily say, hey, I'm trying to win here. Look at what I just did. Stop. Stop. You have no quarterback. Now you have no draft capital. You have no no other means to build your ridiculous-looking team right now. Well, this is what... Um, I'm going to use Antonio Brown as an example. Uh, for, for the moment. Antonio Brown, the player... What Kansas City and Green Bay are saying, essentially, is that we can find wide receivers because we've got the great quarterback. Especially in a draft that has a depth of wide receivers, of which I will see one tomorrow. And that is going to be, for those two teams moving forward, that's what it means. 
Now Kansas City has the additional first-round pick. I think you and I both probably feel that they will use that on one of the two on a wide receiver. All right? So you start there. Because now to the Antonio Brown example. When Antonio Brown was with the Steelers and Ben Roethlisberger was quarterbacking, oh, one big game after another, one big game after another. When Antonio Brown was out of the lineup, did Ben Roethlisberger keep having big games? Yes. This is the, I'm not talking about the last two years. I'm talking when Brown had to be out of the lineup when Ben was in his prime. Did Ben have big games? Yeah. When, An, when Ben was out of the lineup, did Antonio Brown have big games? No. Four catches, 45 yards, you know, just like a pedestrian day. That's why I use Antonio Brown as the example. I think that you can get enough receivers out there because the Chiefs also lost Robinson, too. He ended up going to the uh, to Las Vegas. But they still have Kelsey. They still have Hardman, the running backs. They can draft and bring in wide receivers to go with Mahomes. That's what they're saying. They're using their draft capital now where they can get a lot of guys on rookie contracts and get a wide receiver, get a couple of guys on defense. They've got various moves that Brett Veach can now make because of what he received. Now, as for what the Dolphins did, look, if you're Sean McDermott and you're Bill Belichick, you do now have a problem in your division. I mean, Hill is a problem. There's no, there's no getting around it. You can't put a price on that kind of speed. But keep in mind, in terms of drafting a receiver, it doesn't always have to be in the first round. I realize that because of off the field, uh, the domestic violence allegations with Hill and his girlfriend dropped him down in the draft, but he probably was a third round pick who ended up being drafted in the fifth round. So Hill is a fifth round draft pick in this whole thing. And probably if he didn't have the issues, would have been a third. He wasn't really a wide open known entity when he came out of college. But as soon as you get get into a camp, you're like looking around like, who the heck is that? He flies like the wind. All right. And that's essentially what I think in Green Bay and Kansas City, we've got the quarterback. We will fill in around him. We can find enough people to do that. Now, as for the Dolphins, they've got Tua and uh, they got Teddy Bridgewater too, right? They did, yes. Yeah, they got Teddy Bridgewater too. They've got Kasiki has already signed his tender on um, on the franchise tag. They've got Waddle. Now they've got Hill. If you're Bill Belichick and you're Sean McDermott, you know Miami has now become a big offensive problem for you, depending on how they solve the quarterback deal, because at wide receiver, which one do you double? Do you double Waddle? Do you double Hill? How do you play that? That's not easy. You still have to get the ball to him, though. That's all I'm going to say. Well, I'm saying that's why why Teddy Bridgewater's there. He could end up being the guy, you know. I mean, he could end up being the guy. And Teddy Bridgewater, to his credit, does not make a lot of mistakes. Now, I've talked to Stephen Ross, and he doesn't like it when you call him a dope. (laughs) <laughs> well, then he should have tank, <laughs> or whatever he's and other, the other ridiculous things he's done with that team. I, I think you're a hater. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just giving you my honest opinion. I think you're. I'm worried about you. <laughs> I think you're. I think you're a hater. <laughs> this. I have concerns. The Dolphins are not a playoff team anyway. They're still not a playoff team. Jeez, 
I don't know. This it's not like they didn't come on last year. I mean, with Brian Flores, the situation on the side, they got up to a one and seven start, and at the end they were making a push for it. The year before they won ten games. It's not it's not like the Dolphins are a bad football team. But they have nothing to get them over the hump. They're they're okay defensively. Sure, they've got but, the, all these weapons now, but they don't have a quarterback. Uh, Teddy Bridgewater doesn't impress me anymore. He doesn't. I'm sorry. He makes fewer mistakes than your guy. Yeah, yeah your but guy makes a your guy makes a boatload of mistakes. But how many how many uh, playoff wins do they both have? Zero. Oh, while well, true, it, it's and it's going to stay at zero for Jalen for a while. <laughs> well, I think it's going to be staying at zero for Teddy as well. I'm just saying, they are not a bad team. I mean, all right, we got a lot going on in the show today. Uh, Matt has already had his. We should do a, a running total of how many people you've called dopes. <laughs> We should just make the dope list. I mean, all people who like, let's start with this, all have more money than we do. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. Well, Tom McCarthy's on tomorrow. We're going to talk about the foul ball he got in his chest. Yes, sir. I mean, we're going to do, I mean, how many minutes do you expect me to do that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really. Well, he's been a busy man lately, too, besides getting hit yeah, in the chest with a foul ball. Yeah, I know. He did the Dayton thing. Yeah, I saw that. Um, but we got Scott Spinelli today. We got Jeff Byers today. We got Frank Bodani today. You know, one out of three, Matt Gut. But that means you're batting three thirty three. On the other hand, I look at it that you're closer to six sixty seven. <laughs> Get the lingerie on the deck. Call the janitor. I got Tyreek Hill. They gave up all this guy. He's a dope. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very quickly in the NFL, you're going to see more deals like this coming up in the next three, four years. Because with the new TV deal, remember, the new TV deal has not kicked in yet. As much as we talk about Sunday night football, Thursday night football, Monday night football, the new TV deal doesn't kick in until this upcoming season, which is going to take that cap number up, up, up. Bigger and bigger deals for NFL players. You just don't like the fact that Tyreek Hill's getting $120 million. It's personal with you. Good for him. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I'm watching the Charlie Brown episode. I, I just want what's mine. I just want my fair share. <laughs> what is it? Charlie Brown Halloween or whatever it is. The Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown. I just want my fair share. <laughs> I can hear you now. All right. We'll come back with more in a moment on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Hmm. When car repairs get difficult. Well, I, I just don't know. Um, me neither. We get good. Sunbury Motors. More than quality new and used cars, Sunbury Motors specializes in complicated auto repair diagnosis. They can handle intricate repairs and even complete auto body with service open Monday through Friday, 7 till 4. And Sunbury Motors has made simple repairs easy. Maintaining your vehicle is necessary. Finding the time to do it is difficult. Welcome to Sunbury Motors Quick Lane. Open 7 till 4, Monday through Friday. Just walk in or call ahead. Relax in their remodeled waiting room with Wi-Fi, beverages, and snacks. Will Sunbury Motors factory train techs take care of your oil change, tire alignments, brakes, and inspections. Quick Lane, 6.30 to 6, Monday through Friday, Saturday, 6.30 till 2. Sunbury Motors, Ford and Hyundai, North 4th Street, Sunbury, and Sunbury Motors, Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. We take the mm. Mm. out of auto repair. Taking your calls at 800-795-9565. <laughs> this is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. 
Now, from the uh, Sunbury Motor Studio, here's Steve Jones. I think we ought to put together the Matt Catrillo Dope Hall of Fame. <laughs> He's a dope. He's a dope. <laughs> We can just make the think? list, that's all. The what? I didn't make the list? No, we, we can just make it the, the dope list. I've already called it that. Have... But Dope Hall of Fame that? works, too. Whatever you want to call it. It's, you know, I think it just sounds more regal. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I'm fine to call it that. Then I thought about this during the break. You didn't get any of today's guests. All right, so he actually went over three for today. Yes, <laughs> yes. It's like, oh wow. All right, uh, tomorrow's pro day. By the way, here. Um, last year it was Jason Odafe Owe and Micah Parsons blazing in forties. Where I just sat there and went, holy moly. Tomorrow, we'll see tomorrow what whether Jahan wants to run. I think Jahan might want to run tomorrow. I saw Arnold Epicati on Monday and Jesse Lucchetta on Monday. Um, I mean, they're ready to go. And they'll get their opportunities with the others uh, coming up tomorrow morning in Huluba Hall. Uh, there'll be several people in attendance a few of which Matt has referred to as dopes. Should I tell them that they made the Hall of Fame, or should I just keep that to myself? You can tell them. I don't care. <laughs> He's a dope. <laughs> you know, I have a guy I work with, and he referred you on the air as a dope. <laughs> <laughs> it's always an interesting conversation when you start out that way, don't you think? They're just the look on their respective faces. Well, it's how you learn about the person, I guess. Well, no, they want to learn more about you. <laughs> <laughs> That's That becomes the issue. Now, who's this that said that again? Uh, it's nobody. It's somebody in prison. Don't worry about it. <laughs> you're, you're 6'4", 250, huh? Yeah. Uh, no, uh, you, you don't know. No, it's just a fictional guy I made up. Don't worry about it. <laughs> well, that I appreciate. Right. <laughs> I'm just trying to protect you and your family. All right. <laughs> Let's get to the NCAA basketball tournament. Last week we had Scott Spinelli on the show, uh, the former Boston College head coach, assist in many other places along the way. Uh, today's show, by the way, brought to you by Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors, Kia Roots, 11 to 15, Hummels Wharf online at sunburymotors.com. Scott, loved having you on last week. It's great to have you back this week. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. Glad to be here. All right. So let's uh, let's uh, try and do this in some sort of chronological order here. That way, you know, we'll talk, talk start with tomorrow night. Arkansas, Gonzaga. Arkansas has been in the 50s, Scott, in this tournament, and Gonzaga just flat out can score. Can Arkansas score enough to hang with this team? That's a great question. I don't think they can. Uh, uh, look, Gonzaga is as complete a team as there is right now uh, in the NCAA tournament, and – you know, they're complete not only as a great offensive team with a lot of weapons, but defensively, you know, they're one of the tops in the country in terms of defensive field goal percentage, allowing teams a very uh, poor percentage. So they're a team that can do both. And with a team like Arkansas, you know, what they try to do a lot is what they play a lot is that NBA style in ball screen coverages where they try to, if you're on the side, they try to keep you over there. And then we call that ice or blue right. uh, or down. And a team like Gonzaga with their skill in both the backcourt and the frontcourt with Timmy, um, you know, with obviously, you know, probably one of the best players still in the tournament, okay, and Chet Holmgren. I mean, they're going to have a problem with that coverage if they continue there. And I think Gonzaga will expose them there. But I don't think Arkansas can score enough here to beat Gonzaga. Yeah, in fact, Penn State's terminology, and they'll, they'll call it ice. That's what Penn State's terminology right. is. All right, the other half of that bracket is Texas Tech and Duke. 
Uh, now, I know Duke's the two seed, Texas Tech's the three. People don't realize that it is actually Texas Tech that is the favorite in this game. Uh, it's an interesting matchup, but it's a different matchup for Duke. What makes it different with Texas Tech, which I think likes to especially defensively, quote, muck it up a little bit? Yeah, and look, let's start first and foremost with this, okay? Out of the out of Texas Tech's top seven guys, five five a transfer, right? Yeah. And out of those five transfers, four are first year guys. So the job that Coach Adams has done, uh, you know, a guy that's a little bit, you know, sixty five years old, first time head coach, has been remarkable. But here's the key statistic that I think you got to look out for here, and I think Duke is up to the challenge. In, in Texas Tech's nine losses, they average 15 turnovers a game. Yep. I do think Duke got refocused, as we talked about, uh, especially you saw that late in the game against Michigan State when they got down five. They really got it done on the defensive end of the floor, and I think it's going through that type of adversity uh, where they, you know, again, refocus after the ACC tournament, after that loss. I think their defense is going to be a lot sharper in this game. Uh, the one thing about Duke, though, as we do know, is they're going to have to shoot the ball from the three-point line. The way Texas Tech, again, they guard you similar to what we just talked about in that NBA style where yeah. they're going to, on that sideline, they're going to try to keep you over there. They really pressure the ball. Um, they're great in rotations. They really come out of that, what we call the MIG, that help side defender, and they almost trap you on the baseline if they can. But I do think Duke's ability uh, to throw the ball up to the rim with some of those, the Williams and Banchero, and, and I think that crew, but also they're going to have to make three-point shots. If Duke makes threes in this game, and the losses that the six games they've lost, they've been around 32%. They're averaging around 38%. That's a big, big telling stat in this game. They're going to have to make threes, but I like Duke in this game to advance. Yeah, te Texas Tech's one of those teams. They try to make you play on, on about uh, 50 to 60% of the floor. They don't want you using the other 40%. Yeah, they do a great job at it. Yeah. You know, listen, any great defense starts with pressure on the basket. No doubt. You guys know that. Right? Yeah, no doubt. And they pressure the ball as well as anybody without fouling. I mean, look, they – you know, you call that airplane technique where they're running with the ball with their hips and their chest into the ball, and it's physicality without fouling, and you don't see a lot of that. Now, in this game, you know, again, is Coach K going to be working the officials? I'm sure he will be, but that's another, you know, uh, little point to, to look out at this game, you know? <laughs> Scott, he walks on the floor. He's already worked the officials just by walking out. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, I've been there as an assistant you, and as a coach. You, you yeah. know, all he does is walk out. It's like you know, way back, Dean Smith, when he slammed his foot on the floor, four fouls happened. All right, <laughs> so, and, none, and none of them went your way. <laughs> uh, you're absolutely right. Amazing. No, I can't. I'm glad I'm not coaching right now. Otherwise, I'd probably be. Uh, I'd probably be fine. You know. So, yeah. <laughs> Ten thousand dollars going Coach Spinelli's way. Yeah, Michigan, no Michigan, Villanova, size with not just Dickinson but Diabate, and Houston's pretty long. Villanova doesn't quite have that size, but their perimeter is incredible. What style can win that game? Well, I tell you what. Let's start with probably one of the most intriguing statistics that I've seen in my lifetime in terms of what Villanova has done here. Right. So here's what we got here. So you got Villanova, a team that's going to really, um, on both ends, they're as complete as anybody, right? They defend their culture, their chemistry, everything is intact. Offensively, they're the best three-point shooting team in terms of makes per game uh, that's left in the tournament right now. Um, and so here's why I say this to you. They're, the statistic of them being the number one free throw percentage team mm -hmm. in the country, yep. team, team, not individual, right. is on pace at 83% to break the record. I think it's a 37-year record that's intact right now. I think it was 82 by Harvard yep. years ago. That's right. Um, and I, right. And I think if they do that, guys, in close games, right, because you're, you're not blowing Villanova around. I don't care who you are. You're not mm -hmm. blowing them out. And so if they put you in those close games with that, you know, that tough, hard-nosed defensive, um, you know, cohesiveness that they play with, and then all of a sudden it gets close and you think you're going to get there, I think that bodes well for them. The other side of this, look, no team has shot over 50% against Villanova since February 2nd. So they're a very yeah. underrated defensive team. And, look, those kids have come up the ranks, right? They've established those roles. You know, besides Daniels, those are guys that have been in the program, um, you know, they've developed with one another. 
Um, I, I even like the fact of even just the chemistry of the – even their classmates, right, cheering them on. Like there's a relationship with those kids, yeah. with the players, which you don't see a lot now in college with these transfers coming in, you know, for one year. A lot of the student body, you know, they root them on because they're the team, but they don't know them as well. But you got to love what Villanova does. And I think yeah. Michigan, look, you know, my thing with them is and, – and I think this is going to – it's what it's going to come down to – You know, they did a great job by upsetting Tennessee by holding them to two of 18 from the three. Exactly. That's an interesting game within the game. Can Villanova, that unconventional style, um, you know, uh, Dixon, you know, made those shots. He was two of two. He's shooting 50, what, 51%. Doesn't shoot a lot, but Dickinson have a hard time getting out on him, especially on some of their ball screen coverages. But, you know, are they going to have that game plan um, to defend those guys in an unconventional style the way Villanova plays on their perimeter to post guys where they post their guards and they're moving out on the perimeter and they're relocating. It's not an easy game to prepare for if you haven't played against it. But I like Villanova uh, in this game. Uh, Houston beat Illinois. And, you know, look, I mean, I was right there courtside when Penn State played Illinois. And they really, Penn State really did to Kofi what Houston did. Same thing. Because you and I both know when you look at a stat sheet and you see a guy has 17 assists and 56 turnovers, he is not a willing passer, and nor is he good at it. And Houston yep. forced him into it. But they're going to have to play a little differently against Arizona. How differently would they have to play against that team where they have so many moving parts? Okay, let, I st- I'm going to start with this. You look back at this Arizona game against TCU. It's a game that really the formula – for Arizona to lose was it actually happened, and somehow they found a way to win. So credit right. to Coach Lloyd and his staff. Mm-hmm. But in their losses, they've shot exceptionally poor from the three. They're a skilled team made up with a lot of guys who can pass, dribble, and shoot at all positions. Um, you know, they'll play sometimes that five-man um, that's kind of the dunker. But for the most part, they're a three-point shooting team. In their losses, they're 25%, 28 33 um, and against TCU, they were 5 of 27, you yeah. know, and they still won. So right. I think Houston is the number one field goal percentage team in the country. Yeah. They guard you. They contest every shot, top foot, high hand. I think they're around 11th in the country defending the three-point line. I think that three-point line and who is able to get, yep. if they can get uncontested threes and if, or if Houston's defending the three, uh, I think Houston wins if they can contest those shots and limit Arizona's uh, open three-point looks in this game. I really like Houston, though. I, I do. All right. St. Peter's. Uh, what a run. Uh, the last home game they had, the attendance literally was 577. All right, so the, so that's why I love when they show the shots of the gym and it's all filled up. It was never like that all year. Uh, <laughs> they've got, they've, they've, I mean, there are people spraining ankles jumping on that bandwagon. Uh, <laughs> and Purdue, of course. Uh, <laughs> I love that. Oh Purdue, Purdue, of course, on the other side, which, of course, I'm very familiar with. So how do you break this one down with the size inside but also the X Factor, Jaden? Ivy. Well, again, I don't think any of us, a lot of us didn't know a lot about St. Peter's to your point, right? But you come into this tournament and you watch them, and here's what I saw. Oh, and I and I kind of did a little research after. First of all, they're a team that really competes. They get after it. They take on the personality of that of uh, Coach Holloway and that Jersey City toughness. They're a very hard-nosed defensive team. You realize they're sixth in the country uh, in def- defensive field goal percentage, yeah. which I didn't know. Right. And then the other thing, this I thought was remarkable. They are, I think the biggest guy on paper is 6'8", and they're, I think, 22nd in the country in block shots per game. <laughs> so they play a lot bigger, wow. you know, with those guys. I mean, they're longer, they're more athletic, and they're probably those guys that just understand angles and know how to play. So I do think in this game, Purdue's a much more complete team, as we both know. Um, they've got star power. They've got, like you said, uh, real size, right? Real size. But, uh, you know, you can't underestimate the confidence, you know, the, the Goliath mentality, mm-hmm. that chip on their shoulder that St. Peter's is going to have. But, again, I, in the end, I think Purdue has too much, and I like Purdue, uh, you know, yeah. in this game. And remember, the, the, the gold standard in their conference is Iona with Rick Patino, and they got knocked out by Ryder in the first round of that tournament. Uh, North, North Carolina, UCLA. 
Interesting about Hubert Davis, he actually has changed the system at North Carolina from what Roy Williams, and it took him a while to get used to it. All right, then there's UCLA, which continues to play well in the tournament setting for the second consecutive year. What about this matchup? Well, UCLA has gotten very little respect. I mean, I don't think many people are even like looking at them as a team that um, you know has could get here and even advance. And and look, you got to there's something to be said about the fact. To your point, they were here last year. They're a year older. Um, you know, those kids have a chip on their shoulder because of that. Um, and so defensively, that their identity, they really get after you defensively. They're really hard nosed, and they've got star power there, right? They got some guys that you know again you know, can make contested shots and, and really put up big numbers, as we both know. But here's where I think there's a, you know, I guess this is my take on it. In UCLA's games that they played against teams that play fast, that want to increase tempo, yep. increase possessions, they're not very good. They're one in three. They've lost to Gonzaga and Arizona twice. They beat Arizona once, yep. but they're one in three in those games. And I think – Again, if you know how Carolina plays, they, they're averaging close to 79 points per game. Yep. They want to get it on maids and misses. They want to push the ball. Um, that matchup right there in terms of pace and how UCLA you know, plays to this style has not been very, very productive or beneficial towards UCLA. So I think if they can control tempo, and really kind of make it a half-court game, I think it favors UCLA. But if they try to run with Carolina, you know, like you said to you, you know, Coach Davis has done a really nice job at changing. You know, they're really pushing the ball now. And yep. Baycott is underrated. I mean, 17 and 13 a game, guys, at 60% from the field. Yeah. Obviously, Davis was fantastic last game. The York City kid, you can, you know, at 30. They've got enough there, especially if Manic doesn't get thrown out again, um, to, to really give UCLA problems, and especially if the pace is fast. All right, let's go to Chicago to finish up. Providence and Kansas. Look, we went through Providence going 12-2 and when the game's decided by five or less. They haven't had that in this tournament. They've taken care of business early and often against Kansas, which seems to have a lot of great parts to it. Your thoughts? Well, when Providence shoots, this is a great stat. If they shoot 30% or better from the three, uh, they're 22-1, and one, okay? So I think, again, you're playing against a Kansas team that's second in the Big 12 at defensive three-point field goal percentage. So there's a little bit of a game within the game there. Um, you know, look, Kansas, to me, um, is a team that is built to win in this tournament. Yeah. They've got everything that they kind of want. They've got all those kids that come up within the program, um, you know, obviously Remy Coleman's a transfer, but those other guys have been there through Kansas, right? They've been there. Uh, Providence is built on transfers. I mean, yeah. they get all, right. you know, top six guys. But, look, Providence has done an unbelievable job in this tournament defending. I mean, look what they did to South Dakota State, which I thought was going to be a really <laughs> tough game, and they, yeah. they managed to beat them. But um, in this game, Providence, Kansas, if Providence can make three-point shots, um, I think they have a great chance of winning. If they don't, and Kansas stays true to their to their analytics in terms of how they've defended the three all year, I think Kansas wins and could win pretty good in this game. Iowa State, that's the definition of transfers as well. Gabe Kalsher, Isaiah Brockington, just to name two of many transfers on that team. And then, of course, Miami. Uh, it's interesting. You and I know, we always hear, guard play is so important in, in the NCAA tournament that you and I never hear the definition of what, what that means. Yes, it means they can shoot it. Yes, they can control the pace. But they don't. the good ones don't turn it over. Miami has seven turnovers in two games total. That, to that me, is the value of guard. To me, that's the big part of guard play nobody talks about, the lack of turnovers. Your thoughts on this matchup here? Yeah, I mean, they led the ACC in turnover margin, you know, like you, to your point, and, and I think that's a huge advantage. And they also, not only do they, you know, take care of the basketball, is they, you know, they, they cause a lot of turnovers, yes. right? They were second in the ACC at causing them. And what they do a lot of, and I really like when they do this, they did it to Auburn and really kind of messed them up, is any ball screens, which teams are running a lot of, you know, any type of dribble handoffs, they were doubling a lot of those, and then they filled the, the two interceptors with the goaltender, and they were creating some offense and really disrupting Auburn in that alignment, but I think to your point, look, Miami right now is was one basket away to losing from my old place, Boston College, 
right. in the ACC tournament. They yes. lost. If they won that game, if they don't win that game, they're not even in the tournament. Agreed. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, right. So they come back here now with those older, experienced guys. Obviously, they've got Charlie Moore, older, but he's one first year, and then they got Walker. The rest of those guys have been there, and they're playing with a lot of confidence. And they've got tremendous guard play, multiple offensive weapons. And the last thing I'll tell you, they were three of fifteen from the three against Auburn and yeah. one by eighteen. Yeah, a one by eighteen. Eighteen. Yeah. So I got to tell you, Miami is a very dangerous team right now, especially in this game. Um, you know, but I, I would not discount Miami in any of these matchups right now because of the experience, the agency, a point, the guard play. And look, with the ball screen, what you're doing is you're bringing the second defender in there. It's not just that you're screening guy. You also are running the risk of bringing a second defender in, and Miami's done a great job using that second defender. Right, right. And I think when they, like like with Auburn, you know, Kessler's not a, you know, pick-and-pop guy anyway. No. So, you know, it kind of, you don't really have to, you know, you can, you know, if you don't get the interceptor position there, one pass away, you know, you kind of stunt at them and let your big recover, but it does disrupt your offensive rhythm. And I think Auburn in that game was really, uh, they, they, they were disrupt. They were not themselves the entire game. Awesome talking to you. Such great stuff. And we kept you away from a $10,000 fine. So, <laughs> <laughs> guys, thanks for having me. I hope we gave some good insight, and you know, let's see if you know what happens uh, in the future. If we get get together again, maybe who knows? Sounds you know? great, Scott. Thank you so much. Thanks for having Scott, me, guys. Take care, <laughs> Scott Spinelli, former Boston College head coach, and somebody so far that has stayed out of the uh, Macatrillo Hall of Fame. That's correct. Now, I like Scott. Now the dog. Now the dog. I mean, maybe the dog is transitioning into your Hall of Fame. Uh, he's getting close, but it's okay. I'll, I'll cut oh, it some slack. Oh, for goodness sakes, it's a dog. Come on. All right, you're going to tell – if, if you call my dog a dope on, on the air, Mertzi's going to get you. <laughs> that's true. That's why, I, I, that's why I'm going to cut it some slack. You're darn right you And will. it's still learning, <laughs> too. I mean, you, know, you got to deal with Mertzi. Yeah, that's not pretty. Good enough. Oh, no. No. I, 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 in terms of dealing with... No. Okay. We'll come back. More in a moment. Next half hour, Jeff Fires in the NCAA Wrestling Championship. Somebody else who avoided being called a dope by Matt. Um, boy, if we ever get a guest on here at one point, you call the dope, that's not going to be pretty. Here on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Okay. 